All right, so quasi quotation. I think this was the longest chapter thus far. Um, I added some stuff to John Harmon's presentation from cohort one. And here we go. So key ideas from this chapter are quotation, uh, which prevents evaluation of an argument, unquotation, which reallows evaluation, and quasi-quotation, which allows mixing the two, uh, which is useful for metaprogramming. So here's a function called cement. We're going to in sim, meaning convert all of the arguments in the ellipsis to symbols, and then paste all of the arguments as a string and collapse it. So this is what it looks like if we go paste and we do letters, all these you know numbers of the letters in the alphabet collapse and we plug that into cement. This example is, and we use the bang bang canonical, uh, then the actual letters that were stored in canonical are displayed and 3, 15, 14, 20, and so on actually says contrived. That little was, that's John's little R joke there. Left that in. Uh, evaluated arguments obey R's normal rules. Quoted arguments are captured and processed in a special way. So mean one five is evaluated to three. One through five is a sequence generator and library quotes its argument, Arlang. Whereas if you just call Arlang, it thinks it's an object and it can't be found. So a quoting function is a function that quotes one or more arguments. This is often referred to as non-standard evaluation. Quoting function equals a function that quotes one or more arguments, which equals NSC. You'll see these used fairly interchangeably to describe functions in the R-verse. Um, but NSC is really use, used when mentioning arguments, how they're evaluated. So here are some exercises from base. Uh, subset uses quoting of the subset call here um, with just uh, evaluates and quotes this. And then uh, this is evaluated. So quoted, quoted, quoted. And actually this is quoted too after a uh, dollar sign, which I did not know. That quotes its argument as well. So in here, does anybody, did anybody do this one and know which ones, want to point out which ones are quoted? Obviously these, these are gimmies. But in this section here, which one, do anybody want to come off? Mike can say who, which ones are quoted. Nope, all right. <laughs> oh, there you go, okay. Uh, the, it's quoted in group by and summarized the, yeah, cylinders and MPG. Mm -hmm. And then in ggplot, this one actually confused me. So, sil and mean are quoted in the aesthetic, but the aesthetic itself is not, which I thought mm -hmm. was weird. Yeah. Because yeah. It, these two exercises, because I think you left off the remove on the previous one. Um, oh, whoops. And that one was like opposite of what I was thinking as well, because it remove is Quotes quoted, it. but like yeah. it doesn't follow Hadley's rule of the object behaves according, like you can obviously call empty cars um, and get some, 
I guess that maybe I didn't understand how to lose rules. Mm. Yeah, I'm not, I, I wasn't sure about like the ex, what his rule was explicitly. Um, well, I mean, if empty cars was loaded and you removed it and then you called it, it would not be there anymore, right? Right. I guess that didn't, that wasn't his rule for non-standard evaluation. Well, and then in this one, that whole argument, aesthetic um, is not, is evaluated. Yeah. So if you just run the aesthetic, does that work? No. Well, I don't know. <laughs> just can. I didn't understand his rules. I think the AES probably has to be inside of the ggplot function to work. So if you like were in that environment, then it would work. I think so. Kind of like tidy select when you use it with dplyr. It doesn't actually like quote it. It just inside the package namespace, it, it has the appropriate namespace inside of there to be able to evaluate the function. I think that's what it is. Okay. Yep. So that's uh, what's quoted. Yeah. About this one. Sorry, I'm like eating, so my desk is messy. <laughs> uh, so no worries. Uh, but should the left hand side of summarize also be quoted? Like the thing, the mean that's like the name of the column. Right here. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, I don't think it quotes that. Because I think it like uses it process. as like a name argument. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure, but I'm pretty sure it does not quote the name itself. I see. Maybe like a different terminology for that, that quoting. Yeah. I mean, I think what it does is it creates a list of these things internally of like whatever column names you have. And then it like calls them in succession, one after the other, um, using the arguments passed in. I'm not sure what kind of stuff goes on inside of the, the dplyr functions exactly, but I think that's how it works. Okay. But yeah, if somebody wants to check on that and make sure um, can hear back from you in a little bit, figure it out. Uh, my, my intuition is it's probably not quoted though. Uh, so quoting, we'll need a pair of functions, about six pairs, including base, uh, directly supplied versus indirectly supplied. So our line quoting expressions or capturing expressions, one of them is expert which quotes expressions directly. And as you can see, if you drop it into a function here, it does not quote the input to the function. So this is just like an anonymous function syntax um, using base R, you just wrap it in parentheses and then you have some parentheses here. So it's like declaring this function and then passing these, val these values as the argument. Um, and we see that it doesn't quote that one, two, three, it just has X. But if we use an expert, we can quote the expression. So if we pass one, two, three, the output is the expression one, two, three. So experts quotes multiple expressions directly. So you can pass in a number of arguments there. So that's what I think is happening inside of summarize there. So it's actually just like making a list of like names like that. Um, and it's like, you know, value Z is this quoted expression three to the fourth power. Um, but I haven't looked down into the source code. In experts, quotes multiple expressions from the user as well. 
So it's useful for quoting ellipsis. So we can pass in these two expressions here. I know there's a lot of uh, parentheses here, but this is one expression, this is the other expression, and it quotes those as two different expressions in an unnamed list. Yeah, that extra, oh wait, because you put 10, okay. I'm gonna say you got e to the eight and e to the nine, just simplified it for you. Yeah, yeah, that caught me off guard when I saw that too. I was like, oh, okay, yeah, simplified it. Okay, so uh, sim converts the character data in an object or a character directly to a symbol. So we can just turn this character into a symbol this, or we can pass the argument to sim, and rather than quoting the argument, it will store the character vector inside of the object as a symbol object. So when we go and use the bang bang operator on sim object, we end up with MPEG being selected. MPEG, MPG, miles per gallon. Um, in sim converts user specified character data in an object or character directly to a symbol. So we can use in sim symbol um, inside of a function. And what that's going to do is it's going to take this input argument here, uh, symbol, and it's going to in sim the character value in there. And when we pass these arguments to the function, we pass empty cars and we pass it. Uh, miles per gallon as the character vector. Uh, when we unquote that, well, in sim it and then unquote it, we get the miles per gallon again. And we can also do the show how it does the same thing, where if we pass that CHR from the last slide that also had MPG in it. It does the exact same thing. Um, so it in sims it. And then I don't know why I had to use all of here, but I did. So sims converts multiple characters in an object or character vector directly to a symbol. So pretty much the same as what we saw earlier. And if we're using a object that has multiple symbols inside of it. Uh, the bang, bang, bang operator is necessary to unquote multiple objects inside of a symbol. So here we have the miles per gallon and horsepower. So in sims converts user specified character vectors to symbols. So here we go in sims and we can pass that CHR and we get miles per gallon of horsepower again, or we can pass these three variables as ellipsis and in sim them and unquote them with the bang, bang, bang operator and here we go. So with base R, it's just confusing, but we'll try it. So expert equals quote, expers uh, equivalent is a list. And the base function closest to in expert is substitute. So we can create a function that substitutes uh, X the passes in x and then creates an expression that squares that. And so if we pass in x plus y as the expression, then we get this expression out. The equivalent to in expers is an undocument, undocumented feature of substitute. So we can do as list substitute and then use this like ellipsis function thing. And we can pass in these variables here, 
and get a list of quoted expressions. So B quote provides a limited form of quasi quotation uh, using the tilde and the dot. This formula is a quoting function that also captures the environment. Back a long time ago, I learned about B quote on Stack Overflow and used it for a couple of things really early on where I was trying to wrap my mind around like, how do I accomplish a metaprogramming task? And it has some odd behavior in certain situations. So does substitute. So substitute can be used to substitute. So we see that again, but we can use the second argument to make it explicit. So we can provide this list, x equals four here. But what we get out is x plus a, even though we passed in 10 times x as a. So this is something to note is that it is not possible to substitute two things at once when you use this argument. When you use the argument, it does not allow you to substitute. It's either one or the other. It in inactivates the expression substitution when a list is supplied to substitute. So here's these handy tables. If you want to create an expression, one expression for the developer side, you use expert or mini, you use experts. And if you want to grab user specified expressions, you can use an expert to grab a single one for an argument. And if you want to grab many, you can use an experts. This is the Arling. And then for base on the developer side, quote for one, a list for many, substitute. For quoting user specified, if you just want one, and then as list substitute dot 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 as many. Unquoting. Quasi quotation means you can unquote selectively. Base R doesn't allow you to selectively unquote mostly. Unquoting means replace the symbol with the stored object itself. The confusingly beautiful heart of quasi-quotation, the bang bang operator, use it to unquote one thing. It preserves operator pre precedence because it works with expressions. So we've already kind of seen how this works, but if we want to create an expression with negative one and we create this character and then we unquote the X, then we get F negative one of Y in the expression, or we can unquote the Y and get F, uh, f of x and a character. Uh, we can create an expression of this whole thing, or we can unquote these, and it will just go ahead and evaluate them in place and give the expression. So now we're on our way to metaprogramming, unquoting a function. Expression, we can unquote the function unquotes the result of f of x of y, so an extra pair of parentheses is needed. So if we try to create a function here that unquotes the function passed in x, y, and we go replace f with mean, then we get mean x, y. So we can replace whatever function is coming in through the from the user there. And we can do it with an expert as well and see how that works more clearly. So to avoid nested parentheses, it can be clearer to use our lang call to, which allows you to pass in a function and you in expert, and then you can uh, pass to, well, this just, adds on the developer side to expressions x and y. We can see that the user specified mean, uh, the output is a expression mean x of y. So uncoding a missing argument. Uh, missing arguments, there's a missing arg function from Arlang. 
uh, and we can use it to make an expression that looks like this. If we unquote, um, or sorry, if arg is missing with no default, it's going to get evaluated. And uh, when we when we try to unquote it with bang bang, and it's going to throw an error. So we can use maybe missing if we're trying to unquote it, and we'll get this expression here with missing values. So this might be useful when subsetting like a data frame with the bracket. It's one place I can think of where we need missing arguments. Um, unquoting in special forms. So this errors, can't just unquote that directly to the dollar sign. Rather, we can use the dollar sign in backticks and call it as a typical formal function. And in that case, we can in expert and unquote our X argument passed in here. And then we'll get the standard in fixed form as the expression. Uncoding many arguments. We've got that triple bang operator. Works with or without names. Unquote splice is what it does because it unquotes the list and then splices them in as if they were all separate arguments. Can be used in any Arlang function that takes ellipsis, rather, regardless of whether or not it's quoted or evaluated. So here's an example. We can create this list of multi args and we can take an expression of F and use the bang 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 operator to splice those in. That's what we get. Or we can use it with call two to do basically the same thing. So these don't exist. So they can't be called as like the formal function form. Uh, they are not actual functions. They're actually built-ins. Um, it's the equivalent of that operator and somehow that quotes and unquotes uh, quasi-quoted expressions. The biggest downside to using a fake operator is that you might get silent errors when misusing the bang bang outside of quasi-quoting functions silently incorrect results when working with numeric values. So we create this data frame with a sequence of one through five and y equals 100. And if we go with df and we try to unquote it, then it's not gonna do what we think it's going to do. If you actually need double negation, you can use the parentheses there around the first uh, exclamation point. If you inline more complex objects, their attributes are not printed. So if we inline this data frame here and unquote it, it's just going to show up as a list. It doesn't retain the data frame attribute. Um, but when we evaluate that, it, it does show that the class is still data frame. The solution, use Arlang expert prints. And when we do that, we see that it is still actually calling it on a data frame. B quote, back to base does not provide an unquote splice operator that allows you to unquote multiple expressions stored in a list. These are the downsides. It lacks the ability to handle code accompanied by an environment. Uh, so we can B quote plus X plus Y plus Z as X, Y, Z. And then we can use this dot operator here to unquote it. And this is what we get. So non-quoting techniques, there are four basic forms seen in base R. 
a pair of quoting and non-quoting functions, uh, which are closely related to the dollar sign subset transform with uh, a sign or the assignment operator and the colon colon or get exported value both work similarly. So we can create this list using var and y. And if we go x var, then it's quoting var and pulling that value. Whereas if we pass the bracket bracket, it's using y as the, um, as what it's subsetting out of there and we get to non-quoting techniques, a pair of quoting and non-quoting arguments, data, save, and remove work similarly to this. So we're storing as one, remove X, and then list pattern X. It's not there because we removed it. Uh, y is two, var C, Y, and vars remove this list and then list anything that starts with y and we get nothing here. An argument that controls whether a different argument is quoting or unquoting. So like this character only flag, which allows you to say that this argument is actually passing in a vector of characters. And then non-quoting techniques, quoting if evaluation fails, uh, then it will automatically default back to quoting it. So we can go help var, and it will show the help for var. If we pass mean in, then it will unquote it and get the help for mean. And if we go var 10, then it, it's going to fail and it's gonna show the help for var. So, the dot, dot, dot. This section is actually more so leftovers than about the ellipsis. So the colon equals or walrus is another fiction to trick R into working how we want. The left-hand side of uh, equals can't be evaluated, so we trick R. R my name, one through three. And then we quasi, or we use the bang, bang to unquote this. And we use the walrus and the value and we get our appropriately named column with the values there. This is probably one of the most useful parts of this. So dots can be converted to a usable list with Arlang list two or with Arlang dots list. Uh, this is a lower level function. Oops, Oops that was a link. The computer okay. fights back. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so dots list is a lower level function than list two. So you can use list two to quasi or to um, turn the ellipsis into a list basically. And you can store the attributes uh, to that object and then pass it out. This is an actual function from per set attribute. And we can see how it works here. List x equals one, y equals two, attribute name z. We pass in this vector of one through 10 and we set attribute w equals zero with attributes opened up and attribute name equals three. Then we can see that these values are passed in and we set each of these, we set W to zero in the attributes and we set X, Y and Z to one, two, and three. Because we have X here being one, Y, two, those are getting spliced in. And then we have this attribute name Z with the walrus getting assigned to three in the attributes. All right, so exec, our lang execs is similar to base do call. Oh, got a chat thing. The walrus is vectorized in data table. The left hand side can be a vector, but not in dplyr. Uh, interesting. Okay. You can only unquote, or like you can only use uh, 
a single character or symbol um, inside mutate, but for data.table, you can have uh, like a multi-length character vector on the left-hand side. So you can do something like, um, like letters and then column equals like one, and it'll create like a bunch of columns with the value one. Um, but if you try to do that with dplyr, it'll give you an error and it'll say like only uh, string or symbol of length one is allowed. Hmm. Is it um, like parallel vectorized? So if you passed in like three character vectors and like a list with three different types of data in it, would it create three named columns with each of the three names you passed in? No, it doesn't like do a correspondence with like left-hand side, right-hand side indices. Okay. It just can't take multi-length left-hand side. Um, okay. So you'd have to like reduce um, and like have multiple mutate calls to make multiple columns. Okay, good to know, thanks. Okay, so Arlang exact is similar to base two call, allows you to use uncoding to do fancy things. So you can call it directly exact mean with these arguments and it evaluates or indirectly, you can go exact mean and bang, bang, bang with args uh, spliced in, or you can mix it up with one of them called when you call exec and then the rest spliced in, they all work the same way. Exec continued. So you can also use walrus if you want. Uh, and you can also functionalize it. So C uniform 10 and an A. And then functions mean, median, and SD. We can map Drupal these different functions with exec and then pass in X and in a remove true. And we get the mean, median, and SD of our uniform uh, random vector there. So the dots list has a couple of features. Ignore empty allows you to control exactly which arguments are ignored. Homonyms controls what happens if you have multiple arguments using the same name. And preserve empty controls what to do with them uh, that should be with the empty arguments that are not ignored. So with base R, there's do call. The first argument gives a function to call. The second argument is a list of arguments passed to that function. Uh, so you can use dots list or list two to grab the ellipsis and pass it to Tibble. And it does what you think it would do. Um, obviously, it's base, so you can't use the bang bang operators, but you can just make a list and it'll work just fine. Case studies, lobster AST. So AST quotes its argument, so we can't really do much with passing this expression in, but it does allow for unquoting with the bang bang operator. So now we actually get the AST of the expression that we intended. Map reduce to generate code. So this was pretty nuts. Uh, let's see if this works. Yes. Okay, so I guess this would be useful for people writing like complicated functional expressions to plug into different linear regression uh, modeling runs. So if we start out with what we're gonna be plugging into our expression, that's gonna be the the expression that's going to get passed in. Start with the intercept, and we want coefficients of x of 1 is 5 and x of 2 is negative 4. And we want to convert it into this expression here uh, 10 plus x1 times 5 plus x2 times negative 4. 
first thing we need to do is turn the character names vector into a list of symbol, which Arlang Sims allows us to do. So we can grab the names and turn them into symbols, so x1 and x2. Next, we need to combine each variable name with its coefficient. We can do this by combining expert and map to. So if we map to along the names and the coefficients themselves, and we call Arlang expert with the unquoted uh, symbol times the unquoted uh, value, then we get these two expressions here, x1 times five and x2 times negative four. In this case, the intercept is also part of the sum. Although it doesn't involve a multiplication, we can just add it to the start of the semands vector. So we're just gonna grab the constant and put it in there in a semands vector. And now we see we've got the constant and we've got the two values. And finally, we need to reduce it by adding a single sum between each of them. And so we can reduce semands and we can say expression, the left hand, side and the right hand side and so it's going to add a plus between each of our expressions when we reduce it i think uh, dot y is like the previous expression from the last reduce call and dot x is the expression being entered on that reduce call uh, if i remember correctly we could take this even more general by allowing the user to supply the name of the coefficient and instead of assuming many different variables, index into a, sequen, uh, a single one. So if we sequence along coefficients and we pass in, uh, we want to pass in the expression y uh, as the object that we are indexing into, we need to unquote that. And since we're passing it as a function, it needs to be in parentheses. Um, and then we can double bracket and unquote the dot dot. So we have y1 and y2. And finish that by wrapping it in a function. So we insem the variables. Yep. Uh, insem the variables. And then coefficient name, map along sequence along and we're taking the values from above so with minus the 10 the number 10 constant and we're going to make that expression with the indexes and then we're going to map along all but the constant and the coefficient with the coefficient name and then make that long expression and then we're going to put together the uh constant 10 and the semands and then we're going to reduce it and so we can plug it in here so whatever we want to use as our object in this case x and we can pass in the different values for each of the constants there don't know if anybody would actually use that but that's Hadley getting super meta on this. Uh, how do I get back to my presentation? Well, okay. Okay, here we go. Slicing an array. We can create this function slice x along index are the arguments that it takes in and we want to make sure those are linked one and stop if not the linked dimensions of x need to save that to a variable and then repeat a, a list of missing arguments uh, the length of the dimensions there and indices we add in along and then we store index whatever's passed in as index and then we create an expression so array sample 30 taking a sample of 30 and then five two three so we can slice x will be the object 
with at the first location, we're going to put a three. And so we get that expression there. Or at the second location, we want to put a two. Or at the third location, we want to put a one. So it basically just stacks up missing arguments for the other arguments and puts the value for index in the location that we specify with along. So you can also create new functions with rlang new function, a function that creates a function from its three components, arguments, body, and optionally an environment. So we can use experts and just put x without an argument there. And then we can put expert and we can unquote the exponent argument passed in from the top level function. And we're going to evaluate that in the caller environment, or we're going to attach the caller environment as the function environment. So we can go power 05, and it gives us a function that's going to raise to the, well, that's really a square root. It's going to square root the x, whatever x is. So there's a exercise where we re-implement the box box transform defined below by using unfolding a new function. So I tried to do this um, by using new function here uh, and then a, a win statement. So in place of the if, I just used per win and replaced based on what lambda was either if it was zero, then we're going to replace it with log x. Um, and for everything else, we're going to replace it with x um, to the lambda minus one divided by lambda. So yeah, that's right. All right, so a little bit of history. Quasi-quotation was first used in the programming language Lisp in the mid-1970s. Uh, Lisp has one quoting function, the backtick, and uses comma for unquoting. Most languages with the Lisp heritage behave similarly. For example, Racket uses the, these are like all languages I have not heard of, um, backtick and at enclosure uses the backtick and the tilde. And Julia uses the colon and the at symbol. All have quasi quotation tools that differ only slightly from Lisp. Uh, so, this is Hadley's note on um, why he created the whole tidy evaluation framework. My attempt to resolve these limitations led to the lazy eval package. Unfortunately, my analysis of the problem was incomplete. And while lazy eval solves some problems, it creates created others. Not until I started working with Lionel Henry on the problem that all the pieces finally fell into place and we created the full tidy evaluation framework in 2017. Yay, done with the complicated stuff. Well done, that was really hard. Yeah, it, definitely a lot of abstraction. It's super useful though because there are some problems that just can't be solved without it. Do you use it in your own code? Yeah, frequently. I can't say I particularly come across it very often. Um, it's, it seems like something that'd be really useful to do, particularly for um, um, a lot of other tasks when you're just feeding in data. Uh, or piping data through, but um, can't I can't find a use for it in my own work. Um, it does look like it could be useful. It's just um, I'm not sure I can get my head around it. I just find shortcuts instead. Well, so shortcuts, probably long cuts that are increasing processing time. Hmm. I mean, it works really well when you want to write less verbose code. So. Let me see if I can give an example of this. Um, I 
I think I think I know where I can find an example of this. Let's see here. If the original code is still commented out, I can show you how I used it. I mean, it's most often, I find it, I use it a lot when I'm consulting because I'm usually making things for somebody else who is also a data scientist. So it's like using their inputs and simplifying something for them. Um, and that's that's where it becomes useful. Like when you're making packages and stuff, you're intending it for people who are calling functions and like using R. But if you're going, if you're like building things like you do, like directly for a business or something, and there's you're not building it for another coder, then you you rarely need uh, that kind of functionality. Uh, let me see here. Unless somebody has a example of how they used it, it's fairly straightforward that they want to share. Open to that as well while I try to find this. Can I show you all the like Walworth behavior that differs between dplyr and data table? Um, sure, just I just stopped sharing. You can right. pop it on. Um, yeah, I use um, I use both dplyr and data table, and like this is one of the times when I actually use um, data table more. Can you all see the screen? Like yeah, our studio. Okay, um, so if you were to do uh, like a vector of new column names, like whoops. Okay, call one, call two, call three. Um, and say that you want to create like three new columns with these names um, and set that to a new value like one or like NA. Um, in data table, you can do something like, uh, let's grab empty cars. Um, in the J, uh, data table uses um, like parentheses for kind of like bang, bang, but with um, multi length vectors. Uh, mm -hmm. Or this is like kind of their style of unquoting, so they or quoting. So this gets quoted and it gets evaluated in the global environment inside of the J. Um, and so it doesn't create a new column called new calls. It will create um, three new columns because that's the you know value of new calls. It's a three length vector. Um, and is the parentheses like, what controls that? Yeah. So if you don't okay. have the parentheses, then you will oops, um, just get new calls, like this works like dplyr um, without the walrus, like just equal okay. sign in dplyr. Um, if you wrap this in parentheses, the new calls gets, I guess, quoted and then gets evaluated with respect to the global environment. Um, and so you get back three new columns. Um, uh, and this is like kind of useful when you want to do like dummy coding, um, mm -hmm. because I think uh, you can also put um, a function in the left-hand side, I forget off the top of my head, but I've done this. Um, but you can have a function that refers to each element of the vector and be like, if this equals like call one, set that to one, call two, set that to two, something like that. Um, in dplyr, you can't do that. So um, obviously you can do something like this, um, where you would mm -hmm. just have a new name called new calls. Um, you would expect maybe something like bang, bang, bang to work because this is a multi-length vector. Um, mm -hmm. It doesn't. Um, if you mm -hmm. want to try, I think with just Wallers, it will tell you, or that's uh, the same thing. Um, if you want to try, uh, how would you do it? If you want to grab the actual vector, um, it will error and tell you that you can only have a string or a symbol, um, mm -hmm. which was kind of confusing to me at first when I got this error, but this is like the key part. Like it has to be length one. Um, or it will error. Um, and so like, you can't try to, so like this isn't vectorized, you can't do any of mm -hmm. these. Um, see, again, I tried to unquote it. This should work if this was length one, um, like we saw, it's yeah. multiple length. And so it tries to unquote it and then errors that has to be a string or symbol because we passed it a vector of multiple length. Um, and so if you wanna create multiple columns, like programmatically, um, then I think data table is probably a better way to do it, is my take. Yeah. yeah. Could you do, well, 
Hmm. You could, I feel like you could, you could use exec though. You could use like Arlang exec mutate. Um, yeah. Uh, unsplice new calls. And I think if, would that work? Uh, no, because I don't think could. it, I guess um, if new calls, if you had like rep in a, uh, and then, um, names, new calls, like set names, new calls, uh, rep in a three, and then the names that you wanted, and then you used exact mutate, bang, bang, bang. I think that would work, but it's still kind of more, I think it would end up being more. Yeah, you kind of have to do some kind of a wrapper around it, I guess, to bypass it. The like easy way to understand it is in the uh, documentation on like the dplyr website for um, the walrus with respect to like uh, forcing evaluation of the left hand side is that mm -hmm. um, they kind of explain it as the walrus is pretty much like the equal sign, except that it evaluates the left hand side. Um, and that makes sense for why you can't take a uh, multi-length vector on the left-hand side because we can't do, you know, we can't do like, um, I guess it would be kind of like sims, right? If I do something like, I don't know if this makes sense, but you can't have like multiple assignments on the left-hand side. Um, and so mm. for that same reason, Walrus operates like that in dplyr, inside dplyr verbs. So we can't have just, we just like can't have multi-length stuff on the left-hand side. But then data table yeah. does like a whole new thing with their own walrus, which allows that to be parsed. Yeah. Interesting. I know data table is yeah. super fast too. It's like highly, yeah. highly optimized. Um, I will say you can do like reduce calls. So if I do, do calls wrapper, you can reduce it to multiple um, calls that take, that like kind of maps over or reduces over each element of new calls, because you can do um, something like this. Um, so it grabs yeah. the first element and then mm -hmm. yeah, makes a new column. So you can imagine just like kind of chaining multiple mutate calls, you know, um, and yeah. you can do that with reduce. Um, so you can do new calls. The function is um, mutate.x. And then set in it to data frame. Oh, it needs, yeah. Yeah. Oh, um, interesting, nice. Makes, so that's just multiple mutate calls, but it's like obviously super slow. Um, let me try your code. Oh, huh, that's pretty cool. I didn't, yeah, reduce always confuses me, but that is a good way to do it too. Oh, this does work. Yeah, so if you do really complicated wrap, this is interesting. Um, yeah. Mutate empty cars. That's definitely the most wow. verbose way to do it, though. Right. But yeah, plus one for a data table. If y'all um, need, uh, I guess, there's a good use case for data table over dplyr. Um, yeah. If y'all are, if y'all do that a lot. Cool. I tried to use it a long time ago when I first started using R, and I was like, this syntax makes no sense to me. But now that now if I tried to do it, it'd probably make a lot more sense. Yeah, throwing, throwing a, a browser call inside the J really helps getting to grasp a data table. Um, you, oh, just have to make sure that, that you just have to make sure that the expression that you pass into J returns a named list. And like, that's all there is to it. So you just have to make sure like if something is failing, then at the end of your J call, just do like semicolon browser, wrap the whole J in brackets. And then you like the browser will get called after you do your J expression. And you can mm. see like, oh, I thought it was going to return a name list. It doesn't. That's why it errors. So like I can go back and fix 
and then make sure that it returns uh, a name list, which gets translated into um, column names and column values. Okay, interesting. Mm -hmm. um, when you say J, that's just like the position of the argument to the data table, right? Yeah, so it's okay. like data tables I, J, um, and then like by, but J is basically like the second position. Um, okay. so like I is for rows, J is for columns, um, and then by is like group by. Interesting, okay, cool. I don't know, can you put like an expression in that spot? In J? Like with a, like a bracket expression, yeah. Yeah, so you can do like anything. I think if you try to do something like- um, You're not sharing anymore, by the way. Yeah, yeah, I'm just gonna type in the chat because it's really simple. Okay. Like if you do like DT, put like print high in J, then it yeah. will just print high. <laughs> um, oh, cool. I think. So or just like it will print, it. Yeah, it will print the data table and then high, or it will just print high. Uh, but in any case, it just evaluates it. Um, huh. Yeah, so you can pretty much do anything. You can put in another data table inside the J, yeah. Interesting. Cool, thank you. Anybody have any wins this week? Fun things they did with R? Or just in life, generally? I'm making some animations again <laughs> for one of my papers. Oh yeah. And the reviewer asked for some simulated behavior. So you want to show us? <laughs> yeah. Do I want to show you? Uh, it's not very exciting, but I can show you. So, do you guys know what reinforcement learning is? Yeah. So I have this paper in review on um, inverse reinforcement learning for guppies, and this is like some simulated guppies from the yeah <laughs> that's cool is that with gg enemy yeah yeah i i love that package wow, it's amazing so, how did you simulate their movement so i put a um well i can share the archive paper oh. um i fit a model to like the real data Oh, okay. And then I just like use the estimated rewards to then like simulate new okay. experiments. Cool. I had this teacher in my data science program who was obsessed with mechanistic models. That class drove me nuts. <laughs> he just like didn't want people to use data. He wanted people to like explain it through like differential equations mm -hmm. and make like a like a function that could be evaluated to simulate something. Oh my gosh. That Here's class just went over my head. <laughs> just Neat. Flexible. Um, but I'm invited my, so Chris Weichel is my PhD advisor. And we got invited to, they're reading this paper at SAMC. I don't know if you guys hmm. know what SAMC is. Um, uh, what is. What is the acronym? It's a Statistical and Applied Math uh, Science Institute in North Carolina, but. Oh, very cool. That was my win. That's a win. But you'll see all my uh, GG plots in here and I have to make everything black and white and I'm so sad, but it happens. Anybody else? It's definitely not a win, but I deleted uh, several thousand rows of data today by accident from a database <laughs> I've been spending a few hours building. And that, was, uh, that was an enjoyable experience. That's a win. <laughs> um, well, it's not a win because um, I've got to rebuild it all tomorrow. <laughs> yeah, obviously, that's a major lose. <laughs> Yikes, ouch. But, you know, if you're having a bad week, you know, just so you know, it could always be worse. <laughs> True that. That uh, paper's really awesome. I might have to look into GG Anime a bit. That's really cool. I saw um, uh, a question that uh, June actually answered the other day, which was amazing. It's really nice to look yeah. at and 
probably helps people understand grass a bit better because it adds that extra bit of information in there, doesn't it? Yeah, it's yeah. like GG Enemy uses like its own very high level API so that you don't have to think of like frame by frame um, manipulations. So yeah, instead of trying really to think cool. of, yeah, how to like for loop and create multiple plots and patch them together, um, you're kind of thinking of like different, I guess, like engines that can animate um, like a static plot, but through like a continuous like dimension of time, I guess. Um, mm. Which, yeah, there's there's a lot to look into um, for GG Enemy. So I've learned a lot uh, yeah. studying it. It's really easy if you know GG Plot. And it uses like this like gluing. I don't know much about gluing, but that's how it, you get like variable, um, the title changes like each iteration, it'll say that's like transition. Um, yeah. Yeah, oh, cool. I used to do a lot of like, yeah, the, like build a bunch of PDFs and then put them in a gift and <laughs> it was always not great. <laughs> I used to make flip books in my notebooks in class. <laughs> I feel like that was the origin of these things. <laughs> Roberta, are you in a hotel room? No, I just moved to a, a new flat. So oh. I guess that's, that's a win. Our win. <laughs> yeah, that's a win. <laughs> yeah, I moved uh, Friday. So how do you feel about it? Uh, it's all right. It's in a small town in the north of England. Um, I didn't move because I like the place, but because my girlfriend lives here. And so we finally are living together after a few years in a long distance. So, Well, that's awesome. Yeah. I guess Where that's maybe your personal win. <laughs> was this, was it, it was previously her place? No. She used to you live in together. Her. Yeah. Yeah. That's the way to do it. Yeah trying to co-occupy somebody's place that was previously their place mm, never no. works never it's been very messy now because we have stuff everywhere and like we have been buying stuff and i'm in charge of the gadgets so i've been find trying to find every gadget i can so that's been fun what gadgets have you found uh well i got the those trouble that vacuum your stuff uh the room but no is it room pass? Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I got one that mops the floor and then vacuums as well. I got the thing to grow our own like vegetables in the mm. kitchen. That's <laughs> awesome. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Like it's fun. I like the smart lights. I, I just look smart something something that I can plug to my phone. Mm. I don't know if I need it, but I just gonna get it. <laughs> yeah. Cool. Okay. All right. Well, off. thank you. Yeah, it's been a pleasure, y'all. Yeah. Thanks, everybody. Thanks. Thanks for presenting. Bye. Yeah. Do we have somebody for next week? Um, yeah, that's uh, unfortunately me. <laughs> <laughs> you yeah. got it. Are you going to be able <laughs> to handle you. it? Is your is the development thing done? Um. Mm, well, it will be done by the end of the week. Um, the database that, I, that was destroyed today was um, something that <laughs> took quite a few hours to build, like a few months ago. So I'm okay. hoping that the code still works. I think it should. Um, but all I've got to do is uh, f throw that data into our data back end and then uh, force the uh, neural nets to accept the data. And then I've got to do um, some basically error just pull out the pull out the accuracy for accuracy really and just compare different metrics against each other see which one's the best one for the neural net to work with depending on which neural net because we might actually end up having to throw i, I made 
eight different metrics. So <laughs> we'll see which one's going to be useful. Yeah, um, interesting. But it's quite. It was. It was a lot of fun. Um, if, if we're talking about wins, I managed to um, build a lot of metrics, and um, then I had to. Then I found out. Oh, I can't just throw huge amounts of data at this um, at this system. So what I need to do is create a clustering algorithm based on partly on a load of grouping names or categories. These. Um, so basically, I ended up having to do loads of topic modeling that I've not really done before, and that was a lot of fun. Mm. Um, and I didn't realize that uh, is Andrew uh, Andrew Eng, um, yeah. who basically created or was the main person who basically built up a lot of the topic modeling we work on today. And that's the LDA. Really, yeah. So that was uh, that was really cool. Um, I also found out that clustering algorithms are a bit shit, to be honest. Um, <laughs> because, what package should you use? Um, oh, I ended up using, um, uh, I just ended up using uh, cl the typical cluster package with um, Gower distancing and uh, PAM, but I mm. prefer um, theoretically um, K prototypes, uh, uh, sorry, uh, well, K partitioning. Um, mm. But like K means? Uh, no, not K means. Um, it, it's, it's uh, what, what was it called? I think I might have it <laughs> open here. There's a package called mclust that was really good that also had some like functions for evaluating uh, like degrees of fit of how well the clustering explains the data. Um, I found that one really useful. I've, oh yeah, I've got a great package for that. Um, but the one I was looking for, a, a K prototype clustering. Um, so. Use case prototypes and they're uh, better for mixed uh, mixed data. So you know, k-means is fine when you're just using like numeric. But in the real world, most data sets aren't. Um, they're not just numeric. They usually have factor variables in them as well. And k-means uh -huh. doesn't really work with it. Which also means that you can't use, by the way, gap statistics, um, which was really annoying when I found that one out. <laughs> um, uh, anyway, so. Um, what I've ended up doing is a load of stuff that I've never really, um, you know, it's the kind of things that you learn about in classes and you do all the courses, but you actually don't actually ever do anything with it all. Um, and also, I'm more on the stats side of things anyway, so it lends itself into more of my stats and kind of research skills than into the programming side, which is where I'm probably a bit weaker, I would say. Um, but yeah, that was a, it's, re it's been a really interesting few weeks, I'd say. Um, I'm sure everyone else get, has probably pretty interesting <laughs> things to do their jobs too. But like, that was, that was probably one of those moments where it's like, oh yeah, finally I get to do this cool stuff as opposed to, you know, trying to take a quarter of percentage point off, <laughs> off <laughs> a forecast. That's awesome. That sounds really engaging. Yeah, that's cool. Anyway, uh, next week I shall try to, um, I, I should be able to, I definitely get the reading done, um, but it also looks like someone else has done a pretty good presentation anyway. So, so long as I can get through the reading, I should be able to get through the uh, presentation as well. Just hope that I understand it a bit better by that point, because to be honest, I found this section a lot harder than uh, the um, object orientated uh, section, which actually, to be honest, seems quite easy now after all of that, but the this is, just a whole new way of thinking for me. Yeah, it's definitely a, a leap of abstraction in thinking about code. But I think the Arlang functions, when you just kind of grok like expert and expert sims and sims, um, and then quasi quotation, it starts just think about it in terms of like what those functions do. It, it tends to get easier over time. I was just thinking, I mean, I, I know that this isn't something that uh, we could do really here right now, but one of the things that strikes me as missing from these later sections is the questions are fine, and it's fine if you read them because it does help build understanding. But the problem is it doesn't get embedded in your mind. It reminds me of doing data camp, which is you go over it, you learn it, you can pass the section, and then you get come back to it later on when you need that information. It's like you, you learn it a bit faster but it's not embedded really in there. And it's not until you have a project that, you know, a bit like when I talk about the clustering and stuff before, it's like, it doesn't get embedded until you spend some real time actually working on it. It'd be good, cool to have like, say, so 
some kind of guided project, like um, uh, what is it that the, uh, the Python groups love? Um, the notebooks, like a oh. like a project notebook that you could work through. That'd be really cool. Well, <laughs> I have a problem that I'm trying to do on a package right now that involves an experts and meta programming and R6. If you want to help me figure out how to do this freaking thing, I'd be <laughs> I'd be all about it because I've been working on it for like a week. It was that thing I mentioned the other day about the environments and trying to figure out how to attach like an environment to an enclosure, a closure. And it doesn't work the way, like what I did, like seemed like it worked. But when you actually use like eval tidy on the thing, it doesn't evaluate it the way you would hope it would do. It like, it attached the, it attached the environment, but it didn't evaluate properly. It doesn't actually like, store data to the right place in the attached environment so oh i've been trying to figure that out today like debugging it and it's embedded deep down in like an r6 thing and it's data coming over a web socket so it's like it only triggers when the data comes in over the web socket and i can't figure out how to get it to interact with other data in the r environment like i want the data coming in over the web socket to interact with other data in the environment. No, it's not working yet. It's a beast. It sounds complicated. Okay. Um, it's a little complicated. No. Okay. Bye, Bye right. Yeah, sorry. I'll, yeah, sorry, guys. Hey, see you next week. Okay. Bye. Bye. Thanks, everybody.